So when I was a kid, I used to get excited to go to Toys R Us, but now as a 41 year old man, this is where I get excited to go. Right here. Ohio Outdoor Living Group. Let's go, let's go pick out something. Let's do it. It's always funny when someone's like been here. Yeah, they haven't been here before and they're like over here and they look around. Do you have anything else? <laughs> then you get in here. <laughs> People's reaction, it's uh it's pretty comical. Right? It's it's like the adult candy store. It really is. <laughs> For all your cabin building needs. That could be our one right here. Here. So what is this? This is hard maple. Oh, that, that'll look really pretty when it's surfaced. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a good option. Um, it's nice and dense, uh, so it should hold up well. Uh, if you want to use a countertop, obviously you got some crashing fills and epoxy. But, some uh, epoxy and some butterflies. Yeah. I don't need to waste a bunch of time. Let's, let's take this one. Barrett, the guy helping me here, is the owner of the business. He started this business five years ago out of his backyard. Two years ago, he moved to this site and has basically built it to what it is now from nothing. I've got a link in the description to his website. Side, cup side down or up? Yeah, put yeah. cup side down and just more steady. So do we need to flip it over basically? Basically, yeah. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's oh, it's easier to do. Yup. Look at them doing that one, man. You want me to jump around the other side? No. Uh, no? You can be cameraman. Alright. <laughs> Viewers will appreciate that. Uh oh. Oh, that happens sometimes. <laughs> tree was that it was a yard tree from a suburb of Dayton called Kettering and the tree was dying. The homeowner hired a tree service to come and take it out and this thing was destined to the landfill or to become mulch but thankfully the tree service that they hired worked with Barrett. Uh, he comes with his equipment, loads up the tree, they don't have to chop it up or haul it to the dump and it's a win-win so it's really fortunate that this thing could be salvaged and he took about three dump loads of wood off of this property that gets to live on in the form of furniture all right so we we took about a half inch off and we don't want to take too much in one setting to uh, mitigate any movement so how much do you charge for this service uh, so for the surfacing, we do three dollars a board foot. All right, and, and how much are you charging me? Um, three dollars a board foot. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. The man just bought an expensive machine. He deserves to get paid. But I'm I'm excited that he has it. All right, so we're gonna come back in a couple of days and finish this up. As material is removed from the slab stresses are released and the wood moves. So we did this over five days. We started on a Monday, Barrett did a couple passes without me, and now we're finishing this up on a Friday. So taking some, letting it move, and then taking some more, you end up with a pretty good flat slab where movement is generally minimized. Oh yeah, so I'll let it know. <laughs> So, 
grumpy there, not very happy. This is, this is why I do what I do, you know? Beautiful. You know, if I didn't step in and, and save this tree, it would become mulch. And that's just a shame. That's wild too, I mean. Okay, I'm back here in my good friend's shop. Let's go get some bow ties cut into this countertop. Typical Mike, I forgot to turn on the volume for about a day of work. So we're gonna get voiceover while I explain what's going on. What I like to do is hog out material with the router. Um, these are pretty thick bow ties or butterflies. So I do it in two passes. Um, so I'll do a half inch, then I'll move my router a bit and do another half inch. Um, then I go back up with the chisel and work towards my marking line, uh, basically having material as I go, never getting overzealous. Uh, that's the best way to get a tight fit. Once you get to that marking line, you can give it a slight undercut. And then I just plane it down. So, just a little chamfer, little corner relief there, but the top is still intact. I, I don't really don't see any issue with getting that in. Got that thing pretty covered in glue. Sounds like it's in. That is a great success. Planing will push the wood a tiny bit into the gaps and then if you still have some gaps you can always mix some sawdust and glue and fill them in. Alright, let's try and get a close up. A little bit of a gap there. Looks like I got that bit there with the chisel. Little tiny gap there, tiny gap there. Overall, better, better dovetail than I am a woodworker right now, so I will take it. This is the end. It's gonna get cut off right about here, so I wanted to put these in before we made this cut. The stove is gonna be here, and then the sink will be on the other side. Having a perfectly flattened razor sharp chisel is absolutely essential to making these come out good, so use your strop often. And I thought it would be neat to make these two a little bit smaller, so I did, and I also offset the angles on the ends of them. And about this time my memory card got full, which is fine because you're probably about bored of bow ties by now. Let's make sure this sink isn't damaged or the template's the wrong size or anything before I cut this hole. It's pretty nice. I made this template. One side of it's bad, but I can still use it. Let's see how it fits. Something, something about drilling and cutting into this slab really makes me feel conflicted. <laughs> Especially cutting it to put a sink I in. I'll do something with this cutout for sure. Maybe I'll like auction it off to raise money for the mini excavator or something. <laughs> the bits that I'm using this to do this are called Forstner bits and they give you a super clean cutout. You're supposed to use them at low RPMs. So I got this on the lowest speed. They work even better on a drill press. And you don't have to spend big money to get good bits. This is a $49.99 
dollar set and they've been great. All right, so the next step, and I have to admit I'm very nervous to do this, is I have a pattern bit on my router and I'm just gonna route around, route a channel. I have tried this a different way on another countertop I made. I'll show you some pictures of that. And I basically plunged saw with a guide and then hand sawed the rest out and that didn't work that great. And this worked pretty well. Once I had one track made around, I could remove my template and I used the track that I made with a longer pattern bit after cutting out the waste from the middle to clean it up. And I'm just turning this because one side of my template is bad. And what you didn't see is before I'm cutting with the jigsaw, I turn the slab over using the holes to locate my template and having a jig to drill straight holes would have been really nice. <laughs> There's a big chunk of maple. Look at that. Using a ginormous pattern bit to clean off this waste was probably dangerous, so if there's a better way, I'd love to hear from you. It's working good. You just gotta be very careful not to do that. Inch and a quarter looks about right. It doesn't matter quite so much because this is for the stove and there's a quarter inch on either side of play. Yeah. Oh, look at that. All right, well, we got both of those drilled out. That was nerve wracking. I'm going to do a bit of sanding before I move on to epoxying. I'm thinking it would be easier to remove epoxy from a smooth surface. Okay, I've just taken this from 60 to 120. <laughs> it's getting lighter, but it's, it's still pretty heavy. This side is super pretty too. With all this visible spalting. These long cracks have died. So um, I taped them. Guy in the store said the dye doesn't bleed into the wood, but I don't, know, I don't always want to trust the guy in the store. And this is just a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's got a really long set time. To the 50 and the 100. Per instructions from my friend, you stir the crap out of it. Everyone decides to text me when I'm filming. Well, it's not bleeding out the underside yet. Looks like, uh, let's wait a little bit for this to settle and then we'll pour some more. And then I've got a heat gun. Allegedly, you can't get the bubbles out with a heat gun. So this epoxy has been curing for just shy of 24 hours and it has settled in um, in some places in the cracks which is not necessarily surprising and what we're going to do is just mix up another batch and pour again. Okay so our epoxy has been curing for between two to three days depending on when I poured it and I'm going to show you guys something I learned along the way because I'm learning as I do this as well. So right here I came back after 24 hours 
when the epoxy was soft, not fully cured, and I scraped it off with a planer blade. And right here, I left it. Right here, um, I just sanded it down. And so I had read conflicting reports about what was the best way to deal with the epoxy, and this definitely worked better. So let's do this right now so you can see how it shapes up. So as you can see, that was relatively easy to take down with some 60 grit sandpaper, and this, you know, will shine up as I decrease grits. Okay, so I got a question I think on Instagram. I'm on Instagram as 50 acres in a cabin about how I sand. And the first two steps we've done now is I go over it, I give it a good once over with 60 grit. And after that, I look at it really closely and any place that I don't like, I'll just go and concentrate on that area and create a dip. Um, to me, this is a handmade item. If, if, it, if you want something perfect, you know, buy something made by a machine. Um, I'm okay with a dip, so I create a dip getting out any imperfections I don't like. After that, I switch to 120 grit. I give it a good once over. I wipe it down with my hands, and then I look at it really closely, and I find any place that there's little squiggly marks from the random orbit 60 grit action, and I make sure I concentrate on those areas and get every one of those out. When I'm done with that, I give it another once over with the 120. That brings us to where we are now. Well, now I've taken this to 180 with the random orbit sander, and what I want to do is work on the live edge backsplash. I'm really excited about that. I think that's what's going to make this stand apart. All right, now we're going to use this fast tool biscuit joiner to attach the backsplash to the countertop. And if you don't have tools like this, I would say do what I did and make friends with people who do because most of these aren't my tools. Just treat them well and buy them beer or uh, whatever their choice is um, and clean up after yourself. Those fit pretty tight. That'll be interesting. And unbeknownst to me on the domino, there is a setting that can make those biscuits fit tight, medium, or not tight. And it would be best to use the uh, medium or not tight setting because what I did made it very difficult to get this glue up together. All right, that was a lot more nerve wracking and difficult than I anticipated. I don't, they, those things fit really tight and I was thinking there'd be a little bit of play, but there's not, so it was very difficult to get this on here, but we got it. All right, so the next step in my sanding process, after I've taken it from 60 to 120 with the random orbit sander, I'll hit it again with something like 180. All these numbers aren't really important. What's important is you progress up and you really don't have to get too crazy with it, but the, the key is to look at it feel it with your hand. We're gonna get a wet cloth and wipe it with that and raise all the grain. And this is the fun part when you start to see what it's gonna look like when it's been oiled. Just that bit of wet water, you go back and touch it and you can just feel how much grain stands up. Oh, look at that epoxy. That cleans up nice. And you can even see some of the sanding marks we missed. It really makes it easier to see what's going on. But that really catches. You can tell when you need to hit an area again. Now, wait for it to dry out. All right, I got some 240 and some 400 laying around, so I'm just gonna hit it by hand with that. Final tip. I got some sandpaper here, this happens to be 100, but I'm not using the grit side of it, I'm gonna use the smooth side. You can also do a piece of cardboard, and again, 
last tip that's probably totally unnecessary, but you can go over it and rub it with the smooth side, and it'll really help get that silky smooth finish. Now the fun part. I got some walrus oil here, made from only the finest tears from the saddest baby walruses, and it's, uh, it's cutting board oil. It's basically oil and wax. So, never used it before. Let's see how it goes. That did not disappoint. That is always fun. So you're supposed to wait 24 hours and then wipe off any excess. I kind of buffed that in, so there probably won't be too much excess. I'm excited how this thing came out. Can't wait to get it back to the cabin and see how it looks. Due to some bad weather and not wanting to drive several hours across different states with this thing in the back of a pickup in the rain and snow, I cannot put the installation in the same video, so you'll just have to keep a lookout for that video, which should come out soon. When it does, I'll put a link and a card to that video. Thanks for watching, and please like, subscribe, notify, and share with your friends.